Hi all, I have an absolutely superb game to show you. This is, to me, my favourite game of the TSEC 2019 Super Final so far. So it's in round 36. Leela had just lost with the black pieces in round 35 in the highly topical Sicilian Neudorf. So we repeat the same opening with Leela with the white pieces now. And this is the Sicilian Neidorf. We have bishop e3, e5, a repeat up till here. This is all the same moves as the previous game. Queen c7 was played. Uh, just to mention, knight bd7 has done well for Maxim Vachier Le Grave in Dortmund 2016. He was playing on the black side against Caruana. And that game with knight bd7 showed that black got an early grip over that c4 square with this knight maneuver and got a nice attacking position somehow, drumming up counterplay. That's that looks like a technical technical move. Bishop g4 swapping off weakens, I guess, c4 a bit, and then another play on that c4 square happened pretty soon. Uh, so Black playing now a tactic. Knight takes d5 in this position, uh, which seems to give Black the driving seat of this game. And um, just a little bit more just to show this game of interest. This is the most high profile game in this variation. So Rook takes g5, looking at the Rook there. That tactic as well looks nice. So uh, MVL uh, won here. White resigned. Caruana resigned here. So that was in 2016. That was with the move Knight BD7 as an example, a key stem game. So anyway, here Queen C7 like the previous game, G4, Rook C8, and here is the end of the book given. G5 is Leela's choice as well as Stockfish's. Uh, so there seems to be an urgency here to stop black playing a move like D5. For example, if King B1, D5 is actually possible. For example, e takes, knight takes, and because of this uh, pressure on c2, this is too dangerous. Uh, it's not just that, sorry, that's not the key point here. Queen f2 isn't even positioned. If white dares play queen takes d5, it's not that c2 is neglected. Can you guess what black plays in this position? A clue here, if you look at these pieces, black actually plays. Uh, rook d8, yeah, and with that uh, skewer, that's very nice for black, of course. So um, g5 stops all this d5 stuff for the moment, dislodges the knight. You might ask, well, what if the knight went to e8? Is that terrible? Knight h5 actually dissuades f4, so f4 here is actually quite nice for white with a big advantage. The knight might swing by it to f5. D6 is a nice target. These pieces all on the back row don't look too well. So knight h5 at least trying to suppress f4. So this seems logical uh, for both games. Rook g1. We see knight d7. King b1. And now b5. One slight, very subtle downside of b5. Of course, pawn moves committal. You can see that it subtly weakens the c6 square. And you might think, well, that's not a big deal. Surely b5 is totally thematic in the spirit of the position. And in fact, yes, black has to try and do something on this side of the board. If black doesn't play b5, let's say bishop f8 instead, then knight d5, this position, um, it turns out this rook g4 is it's a nice tactical target, the h5 knight in this position. And white could even consider sacrificing the exchange, opening up this diagonal. Uh, and this turns out to be uh, very, very interesting for white. Uh, blunting the uh, c3 to g7 diagonal and then getting a really dominant position. Doesn't even have to take the exchange. Can at leisure uh, improve the position and in fact even play for the d-pawn, believe it or not, like this as a disaster scenario. So there's all sorts of uh, disaster scenarios here after bishop f8. Uh, let's just, just I'll take you back to another position here. It's saying knight f8. Instead of knight f8, b5, white could then just go for the, the king's side. Uh, so 
yeah, that's fastening, mate. So say knight f8 here, then this, you know, our white's going to be fantastic. The uh, uh, in good shape there, w winning position. So uh, b5. It seems logical and thematic, but just as a sanity check to check all assumptions about in this game, because it seems as though c6 might have an issue. We have knight d5, bishop takes, e takes. Well, the way the is playing it, because now the knight is kind of justified on b3. Um, yeah, it's interesting when we play knight b3, what do we really mean? What's the intention of knight b3? If the intention is like this for a knight on c6, that's a wonderful intention to have of a knight on b3 if it can actually reroute to the center, a nice more central square later. Uh, and in fact, here, white uh, after knight b6 does play knight a5 to go into that juicy c6 square. And you might think, well, hold on a sec, isn't there a tactical device black can employ here? against this configuration because the queen is holding a5 the queen is holding d5 in the game we have g6 um you might think well hold on what about knight takes d5 it turns out here after queen takes queen takes a5 there's bishop c4 with a strong position using that uh pin but also the rook is overloaded can't take there because of a8 uh dropping so f7 is hit. Uh, so say rook f8 for a moment. Bishop drops back. This position, it turns out, is actually quite nice for white. Uh, for example, f4 here. And white's playing on that d file again. White's switching sometimes to the d file with a big advantage. Uh, you know, like winning the exchange potentially. Uh, if g6 is not played, say rookie 8, then queen f3 and that knight again is the target and then here this is a big advantage for white it's it's really quite nice so there are all these uh implications of knight takes d5 to check out it's interesting uh, uh if bishop h3 is also only enough for a small advantage so i think bishop c4 appears to be one of the key moves here uh so just just to put this on the board by the way uh there's queen takes a8 check there so anyway, it seems as though Stockfish decided the knight's not going to be such a big deal. It wasn't immediately planted on c6. Uh, we have this rook g4. Okay, now we have rook a b8. Again, checking this out here, this tactic, uh, this position, maybe uh, rook h4. Is the way to go here for example like this is uh, a good attacking prospect for white white's getting uh, a nice attacking uh, pressure here which should secure a big advantage there's a g file attack uh, yeah this this scenario is even if the queens come off it's very very nice for white white gets a big advantage uh, so yeah, this tactic again, you know, it wasn't employed. Knight takes d5. So we have rook a b8. And now uh knight knight c6, there might uh there might be some tricks for black. Um but uh Lila's not interested in knight c6. Uh she actually plays c4, believe it or not. We have knight takes c4, bishop takes c4. B takes rook takes c4. Now this is definitely establishing. It seems a knight on c6. Well, it's established knight c6, rook a8. So you might think, well, okay, is it that destructive? This knight on c6, uh, fascinating. Uh, is the fish out of water here or not? That's the question. Okay, we have queen g2, bishop f8. Queen g4 wanting the exchange of queens. Queen e8. On the exchange of queens, uh, the scenario here, it doesn't look too pretty for black, this scenario at all. As you might imagine, if white gets two rooks on the seventh, for example, tactically like this, this, this is a nice idea to get to f6 to use the g5 pawn. Uh, or get a form pawn for a moment. Uh, a fawny pawn anyway. This this is an advantage for it. It's not checkmating, but it's an advantage for the end game. Uh, so anyway, we have queen e8, a4. 
which is interesting is there something going on with these two pawns this two to one pawn majority here or not is somehow the influence of this knight uh, assisting in some way with the two to one pawn majority or well, does it need some extra energy behind it we see f5 which seems an energetic move offering uh, sometimes the f7 square might be useful to hit d5 uh, the knight might want to come back and hit d5 as well but it's left stranded there with queen g2 now we have queen d7 and now king a2 and this is uh, to me uh, a little bit on the amusing side what on earth is going on with this king to me i don't know if you in, if you're interested in fonts style but you might notice on films they have specialist fonts which align to the theme of the film this is like a very subtle thing which does align to the theme of white's potential past pawn plan two to one pawn majority the king might be offering its services here for the queen side pawn majority and that is pretty amusing as as it continues if it goes up the board here or not rook e8 we see rook b4 which does give the idea that the little a6 pawn here on islands on its own no pawn is an island as they say or no man is islands might actually be a victim in some circumstances itself uh, we have f4 bishop f2 queen f5 a5 which does fix that target we have king h8 queen g4 queen c2 now there's an episode here of repetition and maybe it's like can leader actually make progress here uh, we have in fact queen g2 in this position and king g8 was played you might wonder well what if stockfish had repeated with queen c2 queen f1 is okay and there's enough to evict the queen back to f5 if the queen doesn't take itself back to f5 then the door can be shut to that queen and the queen is looking a little bit stranded here as you can see uh, all its all her squares have been taken away and in fact white can arrange the queen to be checkmated with queen e1 now that all the escape squares of the queen have been taken rook d2 and white's going to be winning that queen so black would black has to be careful here uh with this queen c2 we see king g8 bishop e1 so officially stopping queen c2 knight g7 and black has been quite clever in indulging our in sliding block puzzles by moving the bishop here the knight can take that space and then maybe the knight might want to do this and the bishop go back and the might want to be supported by the bishop on that d4 square so that seems to be black's sliding block puzzle plan, plan which of course does improve it seems the visual prospects of the knight a knight on the rim is dim as they say so the knight's trying to go to university here on the d4 square instead to brighten up its future we see h4 knight h5 again for a moment not quite decided about this university path king a3 bishop g7 b3 uh, sorry and just a point of note king a3 again this little subtle indication you know like those subtle fonts they use on films that what is this aligned to what plan is this what's be, what's behind this king a3 what is the king doing on a3 exactly so we have bishop g7 b3 so taking the pawn prophylactically away from a target you'll note here that there's a containment strategy going on on e4 as well Ninsevich talked about overprotecting central points you can see that the e4 is a blockading point it's not as aggressive as e5 but it's a blockading point which does contain this bishop on g7 so black's pieces are fairly well contained at the moment and as a point of principle if uh, especially if we if we can play our plans without too much counterplay from the opponent or another way of expressing that might be to play our plans with maximum containment all the time then that's more ideal uh, we don't want too much counterplay from the opponent we want the opponent's pieces to be contained in the ideal world so we have here queen d7 uh, bishop f2 
and it seems the E4 block A points is maintained. The sliding block puzzle exercise now is exercised. The knight does in fact want to go to a central square now, like this. Queen f1, knight f5, bishop g7 is coming up now. Queen e2 maintains the block a point. Bishop g7 saying knight d4 is going to be happening. Rook b4, and this unveils the intention potentially of rook b6 to hit a6. That fixed target might be revisited here. The aggressive knight d4, this knight's come a long way from h5. Queen e4 maintaining physically the blockading point. So absolutely blockading the pawn, not just uh, by 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 indirect control, but absolute blockade with queen e4. We have uh, queen f7. It will be, uh, yeah, and taking just liberates the position. If white had taken uh, the knight, as don't want to give black counterplay, too much counterplay. So we have queen f7. If uh, knight takes c6, d takes queen e6 this position is going to be favorable uh, white's maintaining a blockade on d5 now and making progress with that pawn uh, this is very nice black still locked up and white's making progress that's always a good sign both those those things so we have queen f7 uh, rook c1 if bishop takes d4 here just the general uh, c what the danger is you know d5 could drop even if the queens come off black's going to be doing quite well here even ish position there's some prospects for black so uh rook c1 king h8 rook c c4 now we have knight b5 check you might wonder why knight b5 check isn't that potentially tempting white to do something like an exchange sacrifice if black doesn't play knight b5 check, if black plays king g8, it turns out here rook b6, say, say black does nothing, then knight b4 seems possible, in fact, to hit a6 here. Uh, this is going to be taken without too much controversy. So, yeah, if black doesn't do anything, then uh, so black's trying to be a nuisance, perhaps. But uh, now you might want to put this through your own uh, stockfishes to check this position because it's not immediate at least on my machine maybe my machine is outdated now it's not immediate then it's clear if the exchange sacrifice is clear or not Leela does actually play it and it comes out as not really one of the main moves but Leela plays it quite a committal decision a takes and now rook c2 and the punchline of this exchange sacrifice is king b4 and yes, when I was watching this game live, I was revisiting my entire concept of what the exchange sacrifice represents under good circumstances. And you could define an exchange sacrifice under good circumstances is the pieces of the opponent being contained like they are vividly here contained. The bishop is contained by its own pawn structure. White has a very, very nice blockade on e4. This is a very nice containment strategy. And the exchange sacrifice promises some progress for white in terms of past pawn potential, especially if the b5 pawn can be won here. Then we'll have basically a good old story of two connected past pawns coming together. Uh, so yes, this is a very, very exciting move, king b4 indeed, to justify the exchange sacrifice. Uh, so yes, it did, did tickle me a bit, these king moves, personally. If king b2, uh, then for example, uh, black might be arranging uh, something like a counter exchange sack, and white might only get a small edge there. So king b4 actually seems a precise move, believe it or not. Uh, Counterintuitive in some respects, you might think, to bring the king out and about. Uh, but it's perfectly safe, it seems. Queen d3. We have king g7. On queen a6, then queen takes b5 is possible. So you'll note the knight's a guardian of the b5, uh, b8 square here. It's enough to safeguard white's king. And then white can end up getting a big advantage there. So uh, we have king g7. Queen takes b5. Queen d7. And now king a4, which permits queen h3. 
Stockfish around here might have been thinking of some other possibilities, but this seems okay. Queen e2, Queen h1, and still making progress. So containment with progress. That's an ideal scenario to have in a chess game. You want to be doing stuff and you want the opponent just to be contained, bottled up. So King f7 here is played. If e4, this does, maybe you might think it's a coordination of the queen and the rook for this e4 break. But it turns out here, it doesn't seem to be doing that much. The king could actually park itself on b5, believe it or not, and still make progress with those pawns. The knight and the bishop assisting this advanced pawn here. And white's doing absolutely fine. White's getting a big advantage there. So very interesting scenarios indeed. We have king f7. King b5 now anyway without invitation from a check. Bishop e7. a6 making progress. h6 trying to undermine white's pawn chain over here. By whatever means necessary uh, putting pressure like this. a7 just treating it as a pawn sack to gain more time for white's uh, play on the queen side. White could have uh, taken on h6. There's no disaster taking here. The bishop is still fairly contained. Um, and this position is very, very nice for white indeed winning. So a7, anyway, just not caring about losing the pawn over there. Uh, so that pawn's taken. And now another punchline move, king a6. <laughs> the king's coming to herd these pawns itself. I mean, this is a position the queens are still on, and this is happening. This is outrageous, you might think. We have queen h3. If queen a1 check, there's rook a2, um, for example, b5, and these two connected pass pawns are huge, and this is going to be huge for white. Uh, so uh, queen h3, b5. It's just a wonderful sight to behold to me this game, the aesthetics. To be honest, I covered game 35 and I hated covering game 35 yesterday. I'm surprised that video got any likes because honestly, aesthetically, to me, this game is a thousand times more aesthetically pleasing than the game yesterday, Leela's treatment. That's just my personal preference. I, I, I have, as they say, Philidor, the pawns, are the soul of chess. Apparently he's been misquoted. It could have been the very life of the game or something make the game lively. But to me the pawn structure uh, is something which makes the game of chess fundamentally of great strategic value as well as tactics. And to see the king assist two connected past pawns in this game for me is a delight, an aesthetic delight. My favourite game of the match. We see queen c8 check, king a5 check, b6 is played and out of desperation now stockfish plays bishop takes b6 check if g5 then white could take that d8 so kind of unlocking that pawn potentially it's still pinned unpin for a moment a tickling unpin for b7 potentially uh, the rook could install itself and in fact this torture on the sixth rank could happen uh, as well as the pass pawn so this is absolutely a winning position for white just crashing through for example like this wonderful stuff so uh we have here uh bishop takes b6 check uh another alternative just just to show some of the flavors of the position instead of g5 king f6 knight takes king a6 queen b5 and that b7 pushing through that that those connected pass pawns with the king crowning uh the a pawn soon for the queen a new queen okay so uh b6 and also uh let's say bishop g5 knight takes e5 check is possible tactically on that queen here and it doesn't yeah this is just crushing the two connected pass pawns are going to be winning it doesn't matter if blacks and bishop up the absolutely winning for white so you can get the flavor of the power of the pass pawn potential there so bishop takes b6 in desperation uh now white's still making progress tickling on this side of the board now g6 yep some threats on this side of the board king going there black not even bothering with queen c8 check until now okay then 
yeah the king's moving around a bit bishop f2 that hits the queen hitting the queen again check okay t black's really just tied up here okay white has lost the two connected pass pawns but this is still an overwhelming position with that one passer now queen a6 black uh, did take on a6 here uh, so that really simplifies things and now we're approaching yeah blacks very clearly uh, worse here and in fact pardon me after rook a1 king g7 the game officially ended here both engines thought it was like plus 10 it has to be plus 10 for like 10 plies and that was it so adjudicated win for white here uh, to continue it say bishop c7 uh, and this kind of situation interfering with this rook on the eighth so this pawn can just queen would be an example I personally enjoyed this game immensely in fact when there is such a game I'm a bit nervous about if I'm illustrating the concepts as well as I should do not just the technical variations and for me this is one of those games I really wanted to underline some of the concepts represented and I think they include uh, the king as a participatory uh, resource for connected past pawns uh, the power of installing a knight on c6 the power of a blockade to contain the opponent's pieces uh, the climate for a good exchange sacrifice when the opponent's pieces are contained the concept of making process uh, progress whilst the opponent has minimal counterplay and contain pieces all of these concepts seem to be evident in this game so it excites me personally conceptually this game I, I wonder if it did you please leave your comments on this game I'd like to hear them uh, so if you enjoyed this game as much as me please click on the top left box which should appear shortly become a member at chessworld.net to play against other youtubers you can also test yourself on the variations covered in this game uh, from the improved menu at chessworld the puzzle books option which has uh, a link to the annotated game comments questions donations see the description like share subscribe with the notification bell really appreciate it thanks very much There is, of course, a puzzle book available now at chessbowl.net for this absolutely amazing game. I've tried to highlight, uh, just for future reference, the key theme, so Sicilian Neidorf past pawn theme. So you'll see uh, the image soon for that. So there were 34 key variations. Let's just look at a few of the puzzles which we can test ourselves with. So here, black to play for a clear advantage. Yes, in this variation with the liberating d5, it's not about c2 but actually rook d8 so exposing that disconnection of white's first rank uh, so that was an interesting uh, thing white play for a clear advantage here i think white just plays knight d5 nope uh, let's get a hint f4 ah the point is without knight h5 yes it's logical to play f4 and then knight d5 here nope <laughs> knight d4 right uh, to go to f5 this one white playing black gets mated okay then i think this relies on a blunder if black's not lo looking at h7 silly variation but you get a flavor of the exchange sack if the knight is uh, allowed to be uh targeted uh it is kind of defending black's king as well so white's play for a clear edge here uh knight takes e7 i think this was to do with the d file d6 can sometimes be uh vulnerable this position yeah that was a weakness of the last move bang queen takes a8 uh this one i think does white just drop back to f3 and just take on f4 here hitting i think this is generally this is better for for white White actually could be just taking the rook soon actually in fact on b8 if nothing else uh here i think was it taking here and um now hitting this encouraging e4 nope uh I'll get a hint oh, i was queen there all right queen there to switch maybe over here maybe c3 is needed here 
or rook c1 nope no that that defends c2 all right and that hits h7 of course nifty okay here for a clear advantage uh don't we just take with the pawn nope we take with the rook all right and can we just take on d6 or a6 either maybe not d6 because there's bishop f8 if we want containment we want to keep this bishop contained uh so white's play for a clear edge here uh i think this was demonstrating if if we get a few moves we can play for this a6 pawn here quite safely i think this one for a clear advantage here i think can we not just sack the exchange here anyway no hang on there's something else going on here this i'll get a hint it's check that does help actually it to know it's check uh and can we go back with knight b4 or okay what's the hint here maybe taking now okay just a couple more on this basic filter you can put in your own filters um i think we we're safe enough to take here because the knight's controlling b8 can we just part the king on uh or or do something okay what to do here let's just have a look queen d frame right and then okay getting hints there and this one i think can we do this and b5 i think we can just go for the exchange of queens roundabout here uh on check yeah we could take with the queen there's no tactic there uh for black it seems so yeah um also by the way if you want to check out the the puzzle books uh i've added i'm adding to the famous player category paul morphy there's 142 if you're a fan of paul morphy check out throughout his career it's got the age indicator throughout his career so there's some fun stuff to check out there for Paul Morphy on the famous players category that's uh, the hot category at the moment with the Mikhail Tal book being uh, it seems the most popular in terms of usage uh, at the moment okay thanks very much